Um, welcome to our next installment of From the Podium Lecture Series. My name is Ben A. Spalding, and I am the founder and artistic director of the Spire Chamber Ensemble and Baroque Orchestra. Uh, it's so, uh, it's such a pleasure to have you here with us this evening. I'm going to introduce um, uh, three esteemed colleagues of mine um, that have joined us um, in some really important topics. Uh, so first we have Sarah Anderson. Sarah, will you wave? And then Sarah Braley and Nicole Palmer. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much for being here. Um, we really uh, appreciate it. Um, there is uh, an Eventbrite when you registered, there is the uh, handout. Um, so you should have that. Um, you will also find that in the chat. So this is a big topic that we're talking about tonight. Um, illuminating the soprano voice. And um, something that I learned um, from one of my colleagues uh, several years ago um, is before the age of enlightenment, there was this understood belief that the four basic voice parts represented the four basic elements. So we had the bass voice representing earth, the tenor voice representing water, the alto was air, and finally the sopranos were fire. So it takes little to no imagination to see how this all translates and becomes uh, still relevant today. So the, uh, we're, we're talking about sopranos, um, but every voice part in ensemble singing is so particular. Um, and the, what we're highlighting today um, are some, some nuances of working with soprano voices. Um, so the first thing we're gonna talk about is uh, vowel modification. And you'll see in the handout on page one, I put the harmonic series, uh, something that a lot of us probably saw in um, probably day one of music theory, music theory one, music theory 101. Um, and I bet we often forget though, that the acoustic principles um, inform us a lot about our singing. Um, and so as we are uh, modifying vowels to keep this this idea in mind. There's a there's a reason these things function in nature like this. So let's open it to our panel. When we talk about vowel modification um, in our singing, what are some things that you three think about? I'm happy to start. Um, I think sopranos, especially in a choral setting, are um, asked to do a particular type of singing. And often we're sort of um, spending a lot of time in our high register, in a high tessitura around our secondo passaggio. So we have to modify in order to, you know, try to match what our colleagues below us are doing. Um, and there are two sort of schools of vowel modification. Um, one is basically the higher you get, everything modifies toward a and you need to create more space and, but the vowel itself changes. Um, and then the other school is that you try to maintain the integrity of the vowel, whatever you're doing with your tongue, say if it's like E, for example, which is a very rounded position. And then as you ascend through the passaggio, you drop your jaw to create more space and try to maintain that, um, the integrity of the vowel. And since, I mean, there, you're already, there's already an issue since there are two schools of thought, right? So, you know, people don't talk about this in rehearsal. Everybody just sort of does their own thing. Um, and I think one of the challenges as sopranos is that often we have to modify when our other counterparts don't. And so we get a lot of feedback from conductors about diction, diction, diction. And I think, you know, so many of us are just you know, sort of good troopers and, and want to do what we're being asked to do. And uh, it's easy to try to interpret a direction that is um, more relevant or easier to accomplish when you're in a more comfortable range, as opposed to, you know, way up in your, around your upper passaggio. So um, I, there were some good, uh, suggestions from some of my colleagues in, in this document about what conductors can do to help uh, sopranos manage the diction up there. And, you know, part of it is just simply acknowledging uh, that it might be trickier in a certain range. And so, you know, like ATB colleagues really give us give us much, as much diction as you can and sopranos you know try to try to do your best but really just you know maintain the general integrity of the vowel and really prioritize 
a healthy line and keeping your air flowing and, um, you know, listening to your colleagues so everything is cohesive and lines up where it needs to, um, but still, you know, really trying to um, keep in mind what your own instrument needs to do in that range. Yeah, that's great. Um, Sarah Anderson or Nicole, um, do you want to chime in on this topic? Um, well, Ben, thank you for having us, by the way. And Sarah, that was beautifully put. Um, I don't have that much to say except my own, maybe my own little verbiage on my own little take on what you are talking about. Um, I really stay with those principles of bel canto style to keep everything balanced. And I can only, I mean, I, I feel selfish already just talking about my own take on how this works because everybody's voice is so different, but it's my only experience other than, of course, teaching and trying to make it clear to people, to other sopranos. Um, but I feel like that sort of balance of resonance and keeping that, that um, beautiful ooh timbre that I think choral singers are so good at um, mixed with this tilt forward, this balance with forward singing and trying to keep all of that at bay and in a general healthy feel can always help throughout this process. And that's exactly what you're talking about, Sarah, with these two schools of thought. Some people need to do it differently and drop the jaw. It just depends on the shape of your face and how easy those high notes come for you. They fell out of me at an early age. I was in alto and then all of a sudden I made the switch and it was like Eureka, you know? And then I had to build it to be able to do other disciplines, but the choral music really spoke to me. So everything comes differently for each, each singer. But yeah, I really like the idea of the bel canto style technique where you keep everything super balanced and you can really find, I, I feel like you can find vowel modification with that relatively easily, but there's always, we're always gonna give up a little bit, right? <laughs> we're always gonna have to give up just a little bit of that. And as long as we meet the director halfway and you know, they can pad our checks, I guess. <laughs> Nicole, did you wanna add anything to that? Um, well, it's hard to follow those um, answers uh, from both of the Sarahs. Um, I would just, I would just say that, you know, especially in a choral setting, you want to have unification of the sound and of the vowels. And so even though there are two different um, schools of thought, I think it would be important for the conductor to make clear what he or she wants. Um, and uh, I would say in almost every choral setting that I've been in, once you get above the staff, vowels are generally going to be um, going towards a more ah uh, um, kind of a um, place. I mean, I can't imagine a bunch of sopranos singing e like if they really tr are truly singing e all the way up there. Like no one's going to want to listen to that. Like we're going to have to have <coughs> Beethoven. <more> oh yeah. <laughs> You're going to want to have to have um, more length to the vowel, more uh, you know vertical length to the vowel um, uh, and space for it to not only for it to sound good out there, but for it to feel good in, in the instrument um, and uh, so that you can not only sing that in the first bar of the piece, but all the way to the end, because that's important. Great, yeah, wonderful thoughts. So there's a lot more we have um, that some things that you can read about um, on your own. I wanna get to the question, and I think this is a really important question um, that sometimes in our field, we've, we've not really been brave enough to ask. So um, our first major panel question um, outside of our, our established topics is this one. So I wanna propose this to you three to get your thoughts. So do we ask sopranos to do things that we do not ask other sections to do in the choir? Why? Could we have a broader view of the section sound? Do sopranos have to imitate boys' voices, which are inherently more limited than an adult female or a developing adult female? Can we shift these biases? Um, I don't know if there's been, um, I, I stay quite a bit up to date on various uh, organizations, um, Course America and ACDA and those very things. And I don't know if we've talked about this too much, but I think it really is time to talk about 
these, um, how we, ha we have developed some biases over the years. Let's, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts for a few minutes, you three. I'll jump in again, because <laughs> this question came from me. Um, and uh, it was prompted, I mean, I'm so glad, first of all, Ben, I'm so happy that we are all having this conversation, and I hope that it just prompts more conversations in the choral and vocal, solo vocal community, because it's so necessary. And it was prompted by a Facebook post of mine a couple months ago. And interestingly enough, today there was a related Facebook post among our colleagues. Um, so I was, rec I was doing a remote recording of this choral piece by a very well-known conductor who shall remain nameless because he is still alive. Um, sorry, composer, not conductor. And the sopranos were identically mirroring the tenors. And they had the same dynamic markings, the same phrase markings, you know, dimin crescendo, diminuendo. Um, and yet the soprano marked, the soprano part was marked, um, pure and something else. Mm. I forget the other. Clean, was it? Pure and clear. Pure and clear. Thank you. But not too much. And it really irked me because I thought, why did you mark it forte then if you don't want it to be too much? And where is this comment coming from? And why is there extra direction in the soprano part and not the tenor part? If you wanted something different, you should mark your music that way. And it just... Um, got me thinking, you know, I feel like this often in, in the profession. I mean, I mean, I've been a professional for a while now, so I can't really think back to academia, but I'm sure it happens there too, about things that are asked of sopranos in a choral setting um, that don't seem to be asked from the other parts. And of course, I'm completely biased because I am a soprano. And I know um, other voice parts go through other challenges. But um, I feel, especially in the particular niche that I'm in, um, that we're often compared to the, the sort of Anglican choral sound. Uh, and a colleague of mine today rightly reminded me that it doesn't necessarily mean that we're imitating, we're just imitating boys, even though that's sort of the English um, cathedral tradition, but children in general. Um, and even when it comes to educating children, you know, children are capable of singing with vibrato, so they are taught to have this sort of clean, pure sound. Um, and yet, as adult females, we have so many other colors that we can make. And I have found in the pro world that there's this real tendency to um, ask for that type of sound in all repertoire. I've been asked to do it in Brahms in German romantic repertoire. I've been asked to do it in spirituals, you know, repertoire where, you know, it just doesn't feel natural for the voice and it's not written in a way where um, it feels natural. And there definitely is repertoire um, where you want a really efficient, clean sound, you know, minimalism, lots of Renaissance polyphony. Um, but I really wish we would could talk more about why this type of um, sound is is so desired in the choral community and if we can maybe start to be a little more open-minded about the kind of things that adult female voices can do great great yeah sarah or nicole do you want to add to that a little bit um oh i know um <laughs> sarah i can't follow you every time you're so intelligent and i <laughs> <laughs> I just I'm on my soapbox. Sorry. <laughs> Amazing. I'm I'm writing things down and learning so much. And um I'll just add to it um my own take. I tell you, I can make that sound and I have been so happy to do it every time a conductor has pointed at me and said, do it. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'll show you how I can do it. And it's like maybe that's the problem there are there are so many sopranos out there like you want me to do it standing on my head do you want me to do it with a smile on my face do you want me to do it with like more lipstick on i mean they're we're, we're so eager and willing and it's so wonderful I, I i applaud us for being that way but i feel like i'm part of the problem <laughs> because i love i love that sound but not too much i really go back to that balance um, in bel canto technique where I don't like 
a really forward, pingy, um, I, I do love a, a boy choir, but when they're actually boys. And so it's, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know why it's still around. I really don't. But I, what I do love is when I hear a, a soprano section that has like a voluptuous warmth to their singing that also has clean, you know, is also clean. And I know that, Sarah, I don't know you as well as I know Nicole, but I know that you're capable of doing these things like nobody else can do. And, and then also be able to sing with vibrato, which I know we're gonna talk about later. But this idea of take, stripping away all of the womanliness, that I don't understand. I really don't understand it. And maybe it's because, maybe there is a lack of, we were just talking about this before we pressed, you know, before everybody showed up, maybe there's just this lack of understanding that we're not getting that technique in college to say, you can have it all. You can have this beautiful, warm, rich tone. You can, you can play with your, your vibrato. As long as you have the basics and have this really smart, strong technique. And I don't know, maybe it's not being taught. And so then here we go with the professional choir and the conductor's like, just, just sing like they did in that Anglican way. I mean, maybe they just don't know what to do with us. And we need, we really need those voice teachers like us who talk about this style as if it really matters because it does. Every single soprano I know is also in a choir and either hating it because she has to change her ways or loving it because she, it comes easily <laughs> to her. So it's a really, man, it's a loaded question. I feel sort of heated even talking about it. Well, that's good. I have director good. friends on here. <laughs> Talk about that. Nicole, do you want to chime in with some thoughts? Sure. Um, so uh, again, both of you all have articulated uh, beautifully some really, really important points. So thank you so much. Um, I, I think that um, Sarah Anderson, you brought up a really interesting but really important point here too, which is that um, every voice is created differently. Like it may be easy for you at nine o'clock in the morning to pop out easy high floaty notes. And it is absolutely not easy for every soprano in your choirs to do that, I guarantee. And there are some sopranos for whom that is never gonna come easily. And so I think you really have to respect and understand what the different voices in front of you are capable of and a, choose repertoire that is going to be, um, that is going to feel good to those instruments. Um, and B, not ask every individual to match this individual, mm -hmm. right? Um, because that's completely unrealistic and it's going to be demoralizing for the people who don't sound like, you know, that soprano over there, but have an amazing, gorgeous instrument that sounds like themselves. Um, and um, yeah, so I, that was the first point. Well, there was another point that I wanted to make. Um, That's such a good point though, Nicole. Oh, thanks. Everybody has a unique voice. And so to compare my, <laughs> uh, well, I, a lot of us, I think know Luthien Brackett. She has this great saying, compare and despair. And I love that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's great. I think just I want to just chime in for about one minute on some things that conductors um, can do. And I'm certainly trying to learn as well. Um, is that um, so I'm a really practical person. And so here's some, some things as, as Sarah uh, Braley had, had made her, her post a couple months ago that really got me thinking about this is that, that we, we don't criticize the sopranos first, right? Or if we're going to offer some constructive feedback. Don't always go to them first. I, I know that I have I struggle with that with the first violins. It's the same thing um, in a, an orchestra where the poor violas are, you know, really needing some TLC, and it's just it's partly because our ear is drawn to that um, from the, an acoustical um, phenomenon to the loudest and the highest room in the pitch is usually how the human ear what is drawn to the most. So that's the other one. The other th thing that I've recently tried is to when we're balancing our comments 
um, is to have an assistant or somebody you really trust tally um, who you say what to. So if I'm saying something to the Sopranos in, a, in an hour rehearsal, you know, uh, 40, um, I say 40 things to Sopranos and I only say seven to tenors, um, then, then we need to think about that. We need to shift our bias on how we're um, uh, approaching that. And, and as we're gonna talk more, uh, uh, Sopranos have so many possibilities. Um, so I, I would like in our profession, let's first, um, if we can just stop asking Sopranos to, to sound like boys, there's other words that we can use. Um, there's other ways to get into um, a, a soundscape um, that might be pleasing. So that's, let's in our profession, that's, that's one way that we can, that we can um, go from that. Great stuff. We're going to keep talking. All these kinds, all these things are kind of mixed together. Um, it's, it's a really fascinating. Let's, let's talk about registration shifts. And this is definitely something that um, is, uh, 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 that sopranos often have to deal with because um, composers, um, dead and alive, have, have written some really um, difficult things. Um, so the three of you, do you want to chime in on things that you think about when we're, when we have registration shifts? Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, some uh, kind of e easy gimmies are, um, you know, you want to have the, the breath should always continue to be flowing throughout. Like if you're, I think you're talking um, about um, like largely big jumps. Yeah. Um, if, um, yeah so you want to keep the air flowing. Um, Something that I um, talk with my students about a lot is um, if you are going up to a high note, uh, try to imagine, like basically convince yourself that it's actually not high. And, and some, sometimes you might even imagine that you're going lower. Um, uh, I think that can be really helpful. Also, you know, if you are um, uh, about to sing something high and you're coming from a low register, like have those vowels um, uh, placed really high in your head already for the low notes so that when you get to the higher notes, you're kind of already prepared and you have the space um, in advance. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm passing the baton to you guys. That's great. I love that. I love those suggestions. And when I warm up um, my students, I, I'm teaching all online right now. I'm actually not teaching online. I, I created a program for my students to just practice like a guided practice program. And so I'm really, I mean, I really am taking notes because I, I don't know, I'm just, I'm feeling it out on how to help them without actually hearing them. It's really difficult, but um, I like those suggestions and I always like to do a warm up that starts with something more like an eval or an ooey so that you get the this balance of resonance with the again with the bel canto stuff this the beautiful ooh timbre in the backspace and then bring it forward and then drop your jaw when you go up to the high note and i'm always having them do <laughs> something that starts with those two um balancing act ooh and e vowels in low and then drop it like it's hot for the top and then hopefully take that sort of modification and put it into their um, octave or however much they have to, you know, whatever they have to jump on. And that works for me in, um, for sure, in choral music. It works all the time for me in, in choral music. I love that you said those vowels, Sarah, because I think about that all the time, too, when I'm thinking about, you know, especially the registrational shifts, again, going up through the um, sort of transition area into your upper passaggio. And I think one thing that can be um, tricky sometimes in a choir um, is, again, the feedback we get from a conductor about a specific vowel, um, you know, asking for, for example, like a really open eh in, in the leading up to the passaggio, I find very problematic um, because it's easier for most soprano voices to really kind of narrow through that area and think more about rounding. So again, things like more forward vowels like E, more rounded vowels like U, or like a sort of mixed vowel, um, U, umlaut in German or, or, or Y in French, you know? Um, so I think maybe 
it would be useful for conductors to think about, you know, again, like the, um, this may have been in our pre-meeting conversation, but I'm sure we'll talk about this because Nicole had a great, great thought, which I'll let her elaborate on about um, always thinking of the aggregate sound. And so, you know, if somebody needs to do something individually in order to uh, make it work in their instrument, um, as long as it still fits into the aggregate sound, like that's the kind of feedback that we need from conductors, you know, is this working? But also when conductors are super, um, you know, adamant about having a very specific vowel, eh, 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 it has to be this vowel, um, as opposed to letting, letting the section experiment with certain things to achieve that overall sound. Um, and it may be more comfortable, it's probably gonna be more, uh, uh, it'll be less fatiguing and um the sound will be better because it'll be more resonant and ringing and like sarah's been talking about have that great bel canto balance of of lightness and darkness brightness and depth mm -hmm. i think you hit on such an excellent point i mean so much of what we're talking about is that balance um with with so much of what we do. Um, I just a couple conductor things that I wanted to just throw in. I know we have lots of conductors on the one thing that really helps with registration shifts is our technique. If 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 we are, you know, if we start doing this kind of thing, what 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 are our sopranos gonna start doing? Right? So if I find it easier, if I'm if I'm going if if it's especially and we're gonna get to some pretty crazy jumps here in just a second and they're gonna demonstrate something. I, I feel like a, a low midsection gesture can really help encourage um, just by my body language, I'm inviting you to relax into that sound, to sing it freely, to have that, um, the modifications that you need to do. So that's just one, um, it's, it's, it's easy to want to move up our conducting plane higher and higher as we go. But I find um, actually the opposite. Um, works. Um, let's get to, uh, so we have a couple examples of just some registration shifts. Um, we're at the, um, the bottom, towards the bottom of page three. There's, there's, the music isn't there, um, but there's this famous example in uh, Lauritsen's uh, Midwinter Songs, the first movement, um, and it's, it's just shine warm, and it's from F4 to F5, and that is problematic um, for many reasons. Um, we're, we're jumping into um, to a new register, um, but then we have uh, a semi-vowel. We have warm, which we have to get through and sound beautiful and glorious and in tune. Um, so Sarah Braley, can you talk to us about how you would navigate that? And maybe sing, maybe you could even sing like a good version and a bad version or something. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, well, I actually, um, so again, this is tricky because it's, it's starting in the mid range and uh, going up right into where your secondo passaggio is as a soprano, around um, F5, sort of between E5 and G5. That's often a tricky area for soprano sopranos. But I do think he sets you up well by having that uh, sort of brighter vowel on the bottom shine. The diphthong can bring it forward. And then the the glide, wh, that start, really starts with an oo vowel and there's somewhere in here the phrase threading the needle. And I think about that, that a lot when I'm singing choral music because I'm always really, and straight tone, which we'll get to later, I'm always really thinking about creating an efficient sound. And so it's easy to sort of, um, you know, see a big jump like that and overblow. And I think if both as singers and um, as conductors, we can ask this of our singers, to really think about connecting, always keeping your air moving and really, you know, using that um, closed vowel sh shape to help us there. So if I were to <laughs> overblow this here. Shine, shine, or like pop the consonant, the w, you know, that can make it come out of the texture. But if I'm thinking really about um, the line and just keeping my air moving and threading it through that ooh vowel. Shine, wah, shine, wah. So that it's always sort of morphing as I'm going and that will help create that legato line um, with the section. 
That's great. And there's a lot of music through all of history that has these kind of things in it. And so that's something I really wanted to bring our attention to. So Nicole, you're going to sing the next one, I think. How would you navigate that? We have, we're now we're adding another element. We have sweet up there with a big jump. So we have, when we, uh, so I mean, even before I sing it at all, I, I'm just going to, um, talk about how I would approach it. So we have the sweet, I'm thinking of the, the su and the ooh, all on that high um, G sharp. It would be, uh, it would have not awesome results if we put the su down on the A and then swooped up to <laughs> the G sharp and um, everybody's swoop would be different. So um, definitely uh, uh, if I were a conductor, I would ask all of the sopranos to put the, the S and the U and the uh, um, all on the high G sharp. Um, and again, you know what uh, Sarah Braley said, which was um, keeping the air moving. He's Another thing that I did there was I uh, modified, I didn't say sweet up there. I really said is sweat, you know, um, because you wouldn't want to hear me sing a, a, a real E sound up there. Um, does that answer the question? Do I need any more? Yeah, that's great. Sarah Anderson, did you want to jump in on any of this, this topic or? Great. <laughs> um, no, I love what you two are saying. It's wonderful. And the, all these little idiosyncrasies and little details that we all have to think about, um, especially Sopranos, I guess. Um, it, it's amazing how it works for some people and doesn't work for others. And, you know, I, I love this subject because if you get a chance to talk to your fellow Sopranos in a choir, it's always so fun because there's always someone who's like, oh, I think of cats and how they jump. And you know, they, they say all these things and I'm like, well, I think of like it melting chocolate. And I just love hearing from two other Sopranos um, how they are thinking of these things and adding intelligence to it as, as well. It's really interesting, love it. Great. Our next topic is, is one that is certainly problematic, um, that can be problematic is, and we've alluded to this a little bit earlier, but singing text um, in higher ranges. And we have a few examples that we'll get to um, at the bottom of page four. But again, for you three, um, often there's, a, you have to do some, some acrobatic work up there. Um, and it all has to, again, sound organic and beautiful and have a cohesive aggregate sound. Talk to me about um, how the three of you approach it, some tips for conductors and for also for singers. How can we, how can we deal with when we have text in that, um, in that higher range that, is, that can be, uh, let's just face it, composers can, first of all, we can have composers stop doing so much of that. That's really, really wicked. Um, but there's so much literature that, um, that has that already. Um, so let's, let's visit about that. Well, should I go first? Oh, yeah. Word. Um, I'm thinking about all of this new music I've been singing for the last 30 years. Um, these composers who are staring at you. I can't understand what you're saying, you know, and wanting you to enunciate more and, oh, this is the bit most important part of the text. And I set it on a high D so that you can shine your light and it's written just for you. And I know you can do it, you know, that sort of feeling. I've only had that happen like a thousand times. And I, I desperately want to make those words shine, but then, you know, who's going to pay for my ENT bill when I'm trying to sing some of these words up here super high, but my, um, my, take on how I deliver those, and I'm sure it is for everybody. Um, it, it depends on if I'm a soloist and if it's new music, if there's an orchestra, you know, all the, all that. But let's just talk about choral music. I mean, it really is, we're, we're slightly limited if we are going to blend with our neighbor. Like um, my example that I'm supposed to sing later. <laughs> Go ahead. Can we go ahead and sing it out? <laughs> We're on page four. Okay, so if everybody is, I'm just gonna go to the, the grave one first. 
if everyone is singing, it, okay, if this is a huge, like 50, 50 sopranos singing, you know, we're gonna do something like that. Okay, that's one way. Okay, so, but what if it's supposed to be, Okay, that's great, except I just got extreme, I don't know if that killed, I don't know if you could even hear it, but that just, I have a dry, I have dry vocal folds right now after just doing that. I went for the gold and I nailed it and now I'm tired. Okay, so but that, that's a bigger piece than that one <laughs> measure. So I, here's basically what I have to do when it's choral music. Of course, I have to think about my friends. You know, how are the other sopranos going to do it? Are we going to agree? Let's add some vibrato or whatever. And then usually up some, this is fortissimo. It's a little bit's going to have to be shaved off what I can do. If I could do a, a 10 in fortissimo singing, it'll be easier in a lot of ways, but it won't necessarily work for what the conductor wants or the composer wants or whatever. And then of course that eval helps me because I'm using my forward, you know, that, that bel canto tilt, I'm using that for my benefit, but vibrato is gonna come screaming out, you know, if I, if I use it all. So I have to think about all of those things. And I have been in choirs before where the conductor was like, louder, 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 I need more. And then I literally have to say more like, you, you are, you're okay with vibrato coming in and you're okay with a forward bright vowel. I mean, other things are gonna get added if you want it to be fortissimo. And so that's when the, um, the diction can shine. It just depends on if the conductor is willing or the composer wants that. And then the, the top, one that I was supposed to do first, but I'm afraid. Break, break on a B. Okay. I'm singing bake. Does anyone care? No, I, I'm hoping they don't because if I do break, it'll sound mountain shepherd. You know, I mean, I don't think, I, no one's paid me to ever sing it like that. So. I'm gonna go for that one where I just eliminate that R. I can't do much more than that. And um, it usually works out okay. And I just have to point out that Sarah did that so much better than 99% of sopranos will ever be able to do. So conductors be aware that those passages are very difficult and very mean on the composer's part. Singing an E vowel up there is very difficult and without modifying nigh on impossible and getting that diction in a moving line like that on that first example it's just very hard so <laughs> sarah that you nailed it and most people will not nail it but see i'm lending to the problem i'm like I can you are <laughs> so if we do and, and let's you know if we're thinking about these two examples you know both sarah Bradley and nicole if if you were in a section um how are, just give me some other thoughts on, are you, you're sacrificing some diction, obviously, but are there, are there other things that you're thinking about that um, we, we got to find a way to navigate this? And so can you give us some tips on, um, from your perspective on if we had to do this, if it's not, you know, for, for Sarah Anderson, that's, a, that's, that's something that she finds, uh, you know, fairly comfortable mm -hmm. for you two that, um, what were your thoughts? I mean, I think, uh, you know, above above the staff, I just need a lot more space. And so closed vowels are going to be harder. So the vowels are going to modify. Break is going to, eh, eh, is going to become a more open I eh vowel, like Nicole demonstrated earlier. Um, on a notey passage like this, I'm going to think a lot about just trying to keep um, my air moving and the line going so it doesn't get too choppy, because that's also a... a um, risk that you run when um, you're being asked to really do a lot of diction. Um, it can get very vertical sounding as opposed to really hearing the the phrase. Um, probably more minimal consonants, depends on what consonants there are. And again, on, on something like this, I, I 
as a soprano, especially if I were singing the high part, I would really, you know, appreciate a conductor that said, okay, altos, tenors, basses, really, um, can you help your soprano colleagues out here and give a lot of diction so they can just kind of focus on creating a beautiful sound. Mm -hmm. Nicole, do you have anything you want to add there? No, Sarah said all the things that I would have said and other <laughs> things too. <laughs> Great. Oh, brilliant. I think this is, so two examples. Um, so I, I, I gave somebody that's dead and somebody that's alive um, to, uh, to show that, that it really does run the gamut. Um, just a few, we're going to get into a, a really um, kind of big topic here soon. Um, a couple things that I, I want to, when we're talking about text in um, higher ranges, it is okay to revoice. Um, you know, so so Sarah Braley, you would probably be, I, I'm going to put you on the spot for just a second, but you probably, it's, would you prefer, and maybe Nicole too, prefer singing Soprano 2 on the first example? Definitely. Yes. Knowing both of your voices well enough and working with you for years. And so it's it's even okay if, um, you know, if you have a really dramatic voice, if they need to sing alto there, um, just because if they're working out things, that's totally cool. Um, I, 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 I find that we, we this is what the composer writes and we have to do it, you know, you know, it's like Moses coming down from the Ten Commandments and this is how it is. We have options, right? And, and in the pro choir world, one of the things I've learned the most is that there's, there's arrows between parts sometimes where, especially two sopranos, you know, I, I, this is where I can really shine and I can help out the section, but, but this is where I need to uh, let my, my other colleagues shine. And so we can be flexible with that. So don't be afraid um, to, do, to do those things. And can I just add, Ben, that I love Arwen's uh, comment here about also, you know, just um, when it comes to dynamics, you know, if you're asking, your sopranos to sing really, really quietly. It may be easier to just take um, some of those S1s or if it's just SA voicing to put the sopranos down to alto so that fewer people can sing a little more fully mm -hmm. and create the dynamic that the conductor is looking for as opposed to asking a whole section to like really sing quietly in a range that may not be comfortable for everyone. Yeah, and that goes back to the our aggregate rule. Um, we talked yeah. about that before and that's our, with our dynamics. Um, I know I uh, one of the things that I do inspire quite a bit is semi-choruses. If I want a, a really specific sound, then I'm going to ask four or eight people to sing it versus all 16 or 18 or 20. It just, you can only get so soft. And um, so that's that's part of the issue. That's okay. Ben, this, you were particularly oh, go good at that, Ben. I try. <laughs> I'm, I, well, I'm, I'm learning and growing and I'm learning so much tonight as well. Um, okay, <laughs> this, the, the topic we really wanted to spend some time on uh, today is the idea of a uh, sense of vibrato or a simple tone. There's, there's lots of a straight tone as some people call it. Um, this is a little bit opening Pandora's box, um, but I think um, uh, before I kind of open it up to, to you three is that conductors, this should not always be our default, right? There are lots of ways to go about this. Um, and so uh, the, the, the female soprano voice has such possibilities and such depth. Um, we need to be willing to explore that um, and, and be able to utilize the various colors um, and sounds. And so um, if we can get away from that default um, all the time, I think that's uh, something that's helpful in our profession. So you three, let's, we're gonna take some time and talk about the big topic of sins of vibrato um, and things that you have found health, healthy um, things that possibly are not so healthy, and let's go from there. Great. I feel like Can I'm I... always the one jumping in. Yeah, Nicole, go for it. Nicole, I know you have a really, yeah, you've, you, we've talked about this before, so share some thoughts. Um, so I have to say that I, I, I really believe that if you have um, a choir that consists of adult sopranos in front of you, um, asking them to sing without vibrato for an entire concert, or even for an entire piece is unrealistic. Um, and it's, it's I, I, I would even use the word disrespectful because it is not honoring who the person, who the people are in front of you and it is not honoring the voices that they have. Um, and it's asking them to do something where if, if all the sopranos in front of you were to literally sing without vibrato, they would be hurting their own instruments, which in the long run, doesn't serve them and it doesn't serve the conductors either because you know you want to have singers who sound as fabulous at the end of the concert as they do at the beginning. Um, so um, 
there are, uh, you know, composers and there is repertoire where we want the aggregate sound to be very clean and very clear. But what I think is important for, um, for us all to understand is that not every singer needs to sing without vibrato in order for the aggregate sound, even the aggregate soprano sound, even the aggregate um, soprano sound that is very exposed to sound as if it is doesn't it, to sound without um, sound, sound as if there is no vibrato, but that doesn't mean that the singers themselves individually are creating a tone that doesn't have vibrato. Some of the things that are really important in creating that really clear sound out there um, are number one, the singers really have to listen to each other um, and to sing without ego. Um, you know, I. I have, especially in you know my younger years when I was coming up uh, and in like high school, there are often uh, voices and singers who always want to be the first one to make a sound uh, on any given um, you know in any, any given moment, and um, that is not in the spirit of choral singing, in my opinion, and it doesn't allow everybody to, um, to equally contribute to creating the sound. Um, so we definitely uh, would, I would want to discourage anyone from feeling like they need to be the first one at every, every moment, just a hair about, you know, ahead of everybody else, because it really, if everybody else is singing in a sensitive way where they're listening to everybody else, uh, listening to their colleagues, then they're going to want to match that sound. And then everybody is trying to match a single singer, which is not what choral singing should be about. Um, you also, I think, want to avoid having um, a, a, um, the feeling like it, uh, you don't want any one soprano to feel like their sound needs to be like more present than anybody else's, which is kind of similar to the timing thing that I was talking about, but a little bit different. Like, um, you know, as sopranos, as both Ben and Sarah Braley have made the point that we have so many colors available to us and we can take advantage of those different colors um, to, um, create a whole beautiful palette within um, in a, a given piece or a given concert. So, you know, um, a lot of times in order for sopranos to blend beautifully, they're going to want to really take advantage of the back part of their head and resonating back here. And you don't want to have a lot of like, eh, eh, you know, or hi higher than that. Because when you do, none of those eh sounds are going to blend with each other. But if everybody is beautifully resonating in the backs of their heads, listening to each other, trying to understand what the aggregate sound is and how they can contribute to it at any given moment, then you're going to create a sound out there that is beautifully unified and where, you know, hopefully someone might hear, oh, well, we're missing some of the lower, deeper tones. Like I have that in my instrument. I can, I can add that in this moment. Mm -hmm. um, that type of thing. Uh, I would also add, you know, and this is kind of a response to the earlier question, but this is related about, um, you know, should we be asking uh, women to sound like boys? I mean, I, I would say no is my very clear answer to that <laughs> question. But um, a lot of times I think in professional choirs that do epitomize that kind of sound, Personally, when I listen to these things, I hear a lot of perfection. And what I miss is hearing heart. And to me, music making is all about heart. And if we ask people to cut themselves off from using their whole bodies and from having that resonance that is also comes from the chest and and, and goes through the most central part of who we are as emotional humans, um, I think we're, we're missing out on a really important, like the most important element of music making. So um, I would encourage conductors to think about how they can um, honor and 
and value the whole people, the whole bodies in front of them and, and, and really, uh, which involves using the whole instrument. And yes, there are some moments, like I think it is appropriate on a certain chord, especially if it's at the end of a phrase and it's really high and it's really exposed, maybe for that one note, you can say, okay, sopranos, let's try not to have any vibrato there. Like that kind of thing is appropriate stylistically if it's, if it's done really rarely. Um, but for, for an entire piece, it, you know, you're asking something that's basically impossible uh, and then you're setting everybody up for failure. You're gonna be disappointed. They're gonna be disappointed in themselves. And every singer in front of you, of course, wants to please you as the conductor. That's, that's what we're conditioned to do. That's, that's what we really want. So, so, you know, set goals that are attainable and um, uh, that really allow the instruments in front of you to shine. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Nicole. I love the heart part. That is just, I, we need like the clapping emoji. Um, <laughs> something uh, really important. I just wanna just, for something that is not talked about a lot from, so when we know from vocal science in sonograms that it's actually to, to even like the straightest barbershop singing, like there's something going on. Like you, you it, only a computer and a metronome can make something absolutely where there's, where there's, there's no fluctuations. Um, and so we just have to realize that, that there, um, from, from a science standpoint that that informs what we do. Uh, the Sarah's, would you like to chime in on that? Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, that was just beautiful, Nicole. <laughs> Thanks. <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> uh, one thing we, we touched on in our own private conversation and something I've been thinking about a lot recently is just the technique of straight tone, because it's not something that I was ever taught. And, it, and when I first started, um, you know, gigging as a pro choral soprano, I definitely did it in an unhealthy way. Um, and I think a lot of singers, when they don't know how to do it, they just sort of think, oh, it has to be straight. And they, and they um, you know, clamp down on their larynx um, with their laryngeal muscles. And not only is that um, unhealthy and fatiguing for the musculature, um, it closes off the, you know, the overtones in the voice. And so you're going to get a a choral sound that isn't as warm and round and resonant, um, and it's not going to be as in tune, mm -hmm. um, and your singers are going to fatigue. Um, so I love also what Nicole Nicole said about you know not not programming an entire concert of straight tone music and um, or or even a an entire piece and so you know being aware so so one of the things that's really important about um singing straight tone with a healthy technique or you know whenever we say straight tone we're saying straight tone um minimal vibrato um it's less air pressure that's really what um allows for a healthy technique it's it's keeping your air flowing not closing off not tensing but having a little less air pressure so to ask um, for very loud dynamics in a texture that you want to have minimal vibrato, know that that is going to be very fatiguing. And maybe, you know, like Nicole said, for a chord here and there, if it's something you're really, you really want to hear, um, choose those moments judiciously. Um, and um, be communicative with your singers about where they can um, add a little more spin to the sound, you know, in moments that are not as exposed, um, in moments that are, you know, lower in, in, uh, pitch. Um, so, you know, not, not giving them the impression that they have to sing straight for the entire piece, the entire time. And, you know, at the same dynamics that other sections are gonna, gonna produce, because, you know, the other thing about Sopranos is that, again, like Ben said, you always, your ear is drawn to the high line. So, um, that, that line in and of itself is going to be more prominent. And so we may not need to sing at a, at a forte dynamic. If the other sections are, we could maybe sing mezzo forte and have it a little, uh, with a little less evident spin, um, than the other, than the other sections, because we're just, you know, singing with a little lighter air pressure. 
Yeah, I was going to talk about spin, that both of those answers are so great. Um, and my take on spin when it comes to choral singing is usually people don't realize that we are spinning that vibrato right around the pitch. And it sounds like we are singing straight tone or singing with minimal vibrato, but we're not straightening, you know, exactly what you both were talking about. We're not like taking the heart out of it and just straightening the, the vocal folds. So ah, that's what comes out. You know, everything has to sort of close down and close off to make that sort of straight tone. But to have that, that ooh timbre and that space, I love the back of the head, you know, all of that, that beautiful cathedral dome that we all have in our own heads, to use that and to use the breathing to make that work. Usually, if, if you took everyone out and just had one person sing it, you would hear this spin that is your vibrato. It's just used so efficiently. And that's really hard to do. And do we teach it? I mean, I know that the three of us, we've already talked that we teach it, but do, do teachers really talk about that and how important it is? Because it does make a gorgeous soprano section. It's warm, it's rich, it's clear, it's clean, it's everything conductors want. But how do, I mean, it really has to happen in the practice room and it has to happen with the voice teachers saying, let's let's make sure you're spinning the tone and, and by the way that's a what is what does that even mean you know it's like so hard to teach a concept like that that feels so like rainbows and moonbeams but it is so so important and it makes all the difference when we're trying to blend with our neighbor you reminded me of one other point i'd like to make sarah um Another thing that's going to make it easier to sing with minimal vibrato is letting your singers breathe more frequently. And so one other thing that I don't remember if I mentioned in my comments to Ben earlier, um, one other pet peeve of mine in a pro choral setting is when con conductors want like a seamless sostenuto staggered sound for a an un, unhuman amount of time. And not only is it hard on the singers, you know, to never really have a chance to breathe or phrase, and you're just constantly thinking about, you know, getting to whatever measure is, is you know, when you're finally going to be able to take a breath. Um, I think it's fatiguing for the audience's ears as well to never have that moment to like feel the sense of a human phrase, of a human breath. Mm. Um, and even when, even even if you tell your singers, you know, you can stagger breathe, that gets exhausting to have to do all the time because you feel this responsibility to like hang on as long as you can, and and you're like constantly listening. Oh my God, is my neighbor breathing or not? And then you know, when you're thinking about that, you're not thinking about the music, you're not thinking about the shape of the phrase. Um, and there are just there are so many other ways as as a group of singers that we can create a blended sound. And so I think when conductors immediately default to eliminating vibrato to try to get a blended sound, I honestly think that's really lazy. Um, and I think it's um, gonna, you know, you can talk about unifying vowels, you can talk about the shape of the phrase, you can talk about um, the emotional content of what you're saying. There are so many other ways to unify what you're doing what or what your singers in front of you are doing than just sends a vib. Yeah, <clears throat> often I love that. So such great points. Um, we're going to get into some some more practical ways in just a, a second that we can talk about um, if if our default is not um, always going to that first. A couple things that I just um, I think that helps is if it's too soft, I love this, Kyle Farrell says this in his studio, but if it's too soft to ring, it's too soft to sing. I just love that, right? That it, if, if it, um, and he also gives this analogy where, you know, kind of in, in professional choral singing and if, uh, and also if, if you're doing a lot of choral singing, you're, you have, you're not going to, 
I'm not going to personally, hopefully, um, what I strive for is the three uh, fabulous sopranos on this panel. I'm not going to, I'm not going to ask you to sing so, like that last 20% of, of where your voice can do, right? I'm also not going to ask you probably to go to that top 20% because then things start coming off the tracks. And so you're going to live more in that middle section as an ensemble singer. So we have to be aware of, again, going back um, to the aggregate, um, I personally like just a conductor thing is to, um, to give a, a level. So, you know, our Brahms Requiem, when it's our most um, vibrant section, that might be a seven or eight. It's probably never going to be nine or 10 again to, um, cause so we, we keep an, an aggregate sound that's in tune and balanced. Um, but you can, you, you, there's a whole wide spectrum um, and that's appropriate to the rep and it should certainly change um, with the rep we're doing. I mean, it would be very silly to um, sing. Um, I, Nicole, I don't know if you remember this, but um, we we experiment, we did the Brahms Requiem beforehand piano version uh, in 19, right before National ACDA. And the last movement, we we played around with some Senza vibrato stuff because it's so shimmery and and we were just like, no, that's silly. Like, let's just sing. <laughs> it just We all kind of like, felt it and it just so let's 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 have a really broad understanding of this and so i want to get to this this panel question though so um if we're, we're achieving this cohesive balanced sound um sarah braley alluded to some other things we can do but do do you guys have other thoughts on how we can achieve a cohesive sound without being the default of senza vibrato i do um often if a if conductors ask the sopranos to sing without vibrato my the first thing that i'm going to do is try to take out any ping or like uh nasal mask resonance from the sound um so something that conductors maybe could ask for instead is sopranos can you take as much of the ping out of the sound as possible so you're having as much of the like hooty backhead resonance as you can um and I think often that will, that will create the cohesive sound that out there might even sound sense of it. Um, but no individual soprano has to do any kind of manipulation of their throat to make it happen. Yeah, that's right on with what I was gonna say as well. In, in addition to um, maybe backing off in the dynamic level, like you were saying, Ben, I really appreciate that you don't, you know, we don't always have to do the top and the, you know, the very, very softest. And, and I always tell my students, if you can just take it off the burner, just take it off the burner. It's just so hot. It's boiling. You can make everything feel like everything can sort of line up a little bit easier if you're not giving so much. And yeah, I like that. I really like staying. I, I have been in choirs before where the director has been like, okay, that's a little too warm. I'd love it to be a little brighter. And I totally understand that. But to keep it in that, I, I can always mess with that a little bit, but it's always gonna be all about that ooh timbre and that backspace to make that, uh, make that happen. I like that, Nicole. Great. So um, oh, go ahead, yeah. Oh, sorry. Just one more thing I wanted to mention that we haven't touched on. Um, for conductors to think about is just how you seat your section, you know, because like we said, every voice is, is unique and, and warmer voices can help to, to blend brighter or more silvery voices. So, you know, really knowing who's in your sh section and, um, and thinking about where you're placing these individual voices so that inherently just because of the timbres of the voices, they are blending a bit better from the get-go. Yeah. And that's something you can kind of play around with too. I, I've had, totally. you know, on re rehearsal one, we're in one uh, seating arrangement and then the next rehearsal, the conductor switches things up um, so that you can kind of see who sounds good next to whom, how, how is this working? Mm -hmm. Definitely, great stuff. <clears throat> Part of this is, um, we've been talking a lot of technique and stuff, but I think there are some things that just really practical um, that um, one of the things I love doing is when scores are turned back into me or um, just, you know, if people use my scores is to um, look at what they write down. Um, and I think that's so fascinating. And one thing that we can certainly learn um, as 
um, in the choral profession is our, our instrumental colleagues use write down quite a bit. Um, and so there, in the handout, there is a, a link to a Google Doc where you can see just, I'm gonna go through this very quickly, um, some thoughts on um, how we can be really efficient with these, some of these things we've talked about um, already. So if you'll look at that, um, the first thing is, is we have to strive to write it down. I, I, I'm just, I'm so big on this that um, it's at, at a any, any rehearsal should be fast paced and you should be able to do lots of things, but um, it's very difficult to remember all the nuances of everything. So it's just really important that from a very, from the early, early age, teaching our children's choirs um, to use pencils uh, and to teaching them how to mark. So these are things that I have learned from all my colleagues um, in how they um, mark scores. So we'll just go through this very quickly. Um, so, oh, this is a really important one. It just circling big sections, that is usually not too helpful. Like, okay, that there's problematic stuff there. Um, but let's let's be more specific. Um, uh, so glottal onsets, glottal start, um, incline your ear. Uh, versus incline. Now, you put those two together, you're going to get a funny sound. Um, I don't know if I want to do that on Zoom, um, but just it's really important that so when two vowels are together that we we quickly mark that. Um, double consonants. Um, I liked in uh, the first course movement of Messiah, and our flesh shall see it together. So we're doing double consonants. Really easy to mark. Um, uh, shorthand for accelerando, ritornando, rallentando. Um, really strive for IPA if it because it, it it's really important that we just so there's no guesswork right if we if we find a, a, a Princeton station that works we just want, always want to come back to this especially if you're pouring through lots of rep um, several things there um, this is where I think kind of the middle of the page being specific and not just circling things okay well what um, what note did I tend to sing flat or did I tend to sing sharp um, being specific about you know as we're learning. Um, our music in those first uh, rehearsals. What uh, most of us read intervalically. What intervals did I mess up? If you mess it up once, then um, even the uh, I've seen people that are just they can read spots off anything. But if they mess it up that first time, they're probably going to write it in. Like, oh, okay, that's a just it's awkward. It's probably awkward vowel and some other things. But I just want to make sure it's um, it's really clear. So the next time I go to it, there's just no chance that I'm going to miss it. Um, our, our uh, word stresses, there's various things there. Our dynamics have so much shade in them. I think the most important thing I want to make uh, right now is the singer as a score reader. And so taking in the whole idea of the score. So if I'm, if I'm the third of the chord, where am I coming from? Where am I going to? Um, who, who set up things before me? And this is something that we can start from very um, early on. And when I go back and look at um, all the scores of the professionals, there's lots of arrows or brackets or things that, that are, are helpful to know um, what is the harmony, um, what is the direction, uh, what is the harmonic movement, all of those things um, that we can, we can mark. Um, and I also like to have fun and may not make things so serious. So um, it, it is funny when I see people's scores um, and they uh, will write some fun emojis and different things. But those, are, those help us. What, what Nicole just said earlier on is getting back to the heart of singing. And if, and if it might sound, sound trivial to, to put a heart in front of a note, or an exclamation mark, or um, uh, something like that. But if that helps you to sing from the depth of you, then please do it because that's what I want as a conductor. Um, so if, if that, uh, it's 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 easy to, to, and also what Sarah Burley was saying, to sound mechanical. And if there are things that you can do in your scores to make it natural, um, I'm really interested in not singing the story, but but being the story, being the drama that um, we're, we're singing about. So a couple of thoughts there. I hope those will be helpful. That kind of leads us into our last big topics on why words matter when we're, when we're marking scores or when we're looking at what composers have already written. Why does that matter? And this goes back to something Sarah Braley said at the very beginning, um, that when it's marked exactly the same, can, can there be other possibilities? If the tenors and the sopranos have the exact same thing, um, what are some other possibilities? So in the Google Doc, you have a, a link to this movement from the uh, Rachmaninoff Vespers. Um, and you can pull that up and you'll see there that 
um, soprano and tenor are doubled at the octave. Um, it is, it is uh, um, something that we need to avoid by just saying sopranos. You only need to be pure and clear when the tenors are very capable of doing that themselves. I find better language is to say, sopranos, can you act as an overtone or a shadow or a, um, a covering to the tenors? So if, if I would say that to you three, how would you interpret that how, vocally? What are some things you might do? Can I actually ask you first, Ben? Can yeah. I can I sure. challenge you a little yeah. bit? Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, every conductor is, um, uh, you know, has their own musical interpretation, blah, 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 mm -hmm. and can make any choices they want and ask whatever they want. But, you know, Rachmaninoff marked the same, the same dynamics and, and shapes for the sopranos and the tenors here. So why not let them be as present as the tenors? Yeah, it is certainly a, a valid point. And I might, uh, hopefully what I try to do is in, um, I try to balance it hopefully to the space. Um, uh, there are, I just know from personal experience and a lot of the, the spaces that Spire tends to sing in that it, it favors high frequencies. And so I might ask for just, you know, a shade less, but that's, it's a very valid point. Um, and it, it's something to, to think about. There, there are, um, but I think, but just saying, you know, just marking it and just saying it to sopranos in a way that is um, kind of confining. I think we can open up the, the, the language we use. Any other thoughts mm -hmm. on that? Uh, well, I mean, if you if I were in the soprano section and you asked us to um, sing that as if it was an overtune to the tenor, I would like back way way off of the um, of the sound and and just like almost like dial my ears way up so that I'm really like prioritizing the tenor sound in my ear and just try to kind of float along with it. Um, yeah, and the, kind of like the way that violins create um, the overtone sound where they don't, um, you know, you don't like press your, your finger all the way um, on the string, you just kind of um, uh, let it barely touch and then you get this amazing t sound up there, kind of similar to that. Um, I don't know if that makes sense for mm -hmm. vocalists, but it makes sense in my ear. <laughs> and so I would like definitely not want to have any ping to the sound to make that, to, to try to, um, give you what you asked for. Yeah, so, and maybe we can broaden the conversation. It, it just are, uh, there's, um, so Sarah, I, I so appreciate you bringing that up. Are there th other things that, that we often say as conductors that maybe the, the, we can broaden out um, and we can consider other possibilities if they're gonna make you it, restrictive? Um, I think that it's important that we talk about why phrases matter. Uh, yeah, totally. Sorry. I feel like I'm distracted because I feel like Sarah was about to, you unmuted. Did you want to make a point? No, no. I mean, <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't brilliant. It was just a <laughs> comment. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I, I think this, this whole, um, topic goes back to our, um, you know, assumptions about um, the kind of sound we're asking of sopranos. And, and there, I do find that there are some very um, commonly used adjectives when it comes to sopranos. And, and I'm sure some have come out of my mouth tonight and I know I've heard them from others. And there was a New York Times article about this maybe four or five years ago about, it, it was around when Anonymous Four retired the all-female vocal quartet. And it was about the concept of, of purity in sound and and I sing with Lorelei Ensemble which is an all-female octet and our director Beth Willer talks a lot about um, these words that are often used to uh, describe a, a treble choral sound and which is often a female choral sound um, you know pure angelic disembodied detached um, they're they're oh there's my cat <laughs> There are some very um, charged words that have complicated connotations. And, um, you know, why don't, Beth is always saying, like, why don't we use words like 
like, you know, body and powerful and um, she likes to talk about having blood in the sound, you know, just like visceral, like connecting, like Nicole was saying, like our instrument is our whole body, connecting with our whole body. And even if these commonly used adjectives are, are describing the kind of sound we want, are there other ways we can talk about the sound that um, are maybe a little less charged and are just sort of about the, um, you know, the sound itself and not, not putting on women this concept that we have to be these like pure angelic beings, you know, as um, it's, you know, I, I think the, the more we can get away from like gendered language, the better. Um, and uh, uh, sorry, I'm now I'm kind of rambling. This it, it's a it's a complicated topic, and I'm glad we're talking about it. And I and I think my main point is just to say like words really do matter, and and think about the language you're using with your singers, and um, whether it's really what you want to be saying. Yeah, exactly. Sarah Nicole, do you have other thoughts on this last topic? Okay. Um, well, go ahead. I love, I love that we're having this conversation at all. I love that it's, you know, it's interesting and it's really awkward and uncomfortable, you know, and I think that's good. That's a really good thing that we, I, I'm just excited to see what happens when the pandemic is over and we open back up and we, um, I know for me, I think this tracks with what we're talking about. I know for me, I'm probably going to say no to things, um, that I've been saying yes to for a really long time. Yes, I'll do that. Of course, I'll sing straight tone. I'll do, you know, like I was just so like, I just was on this track of being eager to please, which I'm always going to be, but there's something that has changed in us. And the fact that you're, you know, along with what's going on in society, it, it's it's really exciting. I just wonder what's gonna happen. I'm, I'm excited to be there for it. Yeah, and I, you know, I hope one of the goals of tonight is that you know we're we're beginning conversations and we'll have more and more because um, I think it's it's important. It's important to think about these things um, as we're um, great. Nicole, did you have anything else, or we'll if we'll take the last few minutes to do some question and answers if if you want to chime in, though. Yeah, I just I I wanted to um, uh, just share an experience that I um, had. Um, working with uh, Jane Glover, who um, at the beginning of every concert or when she, uh, not every concert, every rehearsal or when she wanted to get our attention, um, she would say, okay, friends, blah, 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 blah. And then she would make her point, whatever it was. And it was like, I think at the beginning, all of us were like, whoa, what? she's calling us her friends. Like that's so different from this hierarchical, like I am the conductor and so therefore I am God um, and you must do what I say, um, as opposed to like, we're all in this together as equals trying to create this beautiful product. Um, and um, that kind of, that language really, it, it touched me and it changed how I speak to groups when I speak to them um, because it, it was just such a great example of um, how, how your words, the words you use can really make a big difference um, to the, the people in front of you. Great, yeah, thank you. All right, well, we have a few minutes. Um, let's take some time to um, answer questions. Um, you can uh, either put them in the chat um, or unmute and um, our panel would love to try to uh, answer your questions or your thoughts and we'll spend our last few minutes um, doing that questions that we can answer. We've, we've talked a lot about a lot of things tonight. So um, thank you for being with us and, and hopefully we can um, continue with a couple of questions. Um, ben, we haven't talked about money yet. Anybody no. want to ask about money? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, I'm going to bring that up. <laughs> I'm the one who's like, can I have more money? <laughs> what's, what's your dollar per high note rate, Sarah? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's significantly less uh, since the last 11 months I have not been singing. 
<laughs> I don't know if it's worth a whole lot. <laughs> so in the chat, we have a good question. Uh, any advice for the aging soprano? Um, I have a, my studio is um, mostly comprised of women who are over 50. I have a few women who are, I guess it would be my professional, I have a couple professional sopranos who study with me, but mostly it is women between 50 and 85. I have an 85 year old. She is a knockout. She's incredible. I mean, I guess I should say was because I'm not teaching um, right now, but my, my biggest advice for the aging soprano, um, I think I call it something else, mature soprano. I don't know. I'm, I always try to be nice because I'm headed there very shortly, um, is to whatever we're working on, whatever technique we're trying to solidify, that as we go through menopause and as we deal with the problems, it's not like, well, here it comes. This is just the end for me. Like to, to keep giving more, doing more of the good stuff that we're doing. What do we need to get through the passaggio and to deal with the, the um, dry vocal folds or, um, you know, whatever the issues are. There's usually a vibrato problem or whatever. Those or we're losing our range and stuff. All, I feel like all of that can be somewhat contained if we keep warming up. Okay, we're going to have to warm up more. We're going to have to stretch more. We're going to have to drink more water. We're going to have to drink less coffee and wine. We're going to have to, I mean, I hate the thought. It's going to happen though. It's going to happen to me and it's happening already to me. But, and dealing with all of that, we're just, we, we want to be so tender with our voices, but we also want to make sure like when I'm 60, I'm going to be really stretching more. It's just like the, the rest of the body I'm gonna have to lift more weights and really think about strength training. I'm gonna have to stretch every day so that I can move. And if I feel like it's just more of the good stuff, more of those basics and how we deal with our bodies. Now, I, I'm big on inflammation. If I can just make sure that I do everything I can to not have tons of inflammation in my body, I just, I mean, what I eat, I could go on and on I, because I do these workshops for these women and they always think that they're just like, I can't sing soprano one anymore. What am I going to do? And it really, there's hope. There's always hope, but it's not some magic pill. It's just more of that technique and more of the good stuff and being kind to yourself as you do it. Great. Someone I remind me of that when I get older. <laughs> I have a question. No, you're fine. Um, so I'm actually not a soprano, I'm a mezzo, uh, so I sing alto, but um, sometimes we'll have to sing Sense of Vibrato, and so my question is, I've never personally been taught how to do it. I've just kind of come up with my own sort of way, or I'm like, that doesn't hurt that bad. Um, or to be quite honest, I'll either just sing really quiet with a little bit of vibrato because I don't want to have any, you know, inflammation. Is there like, and I know we touched on it briefly, is there a way to kind of identify, like, I believe that I'm singing it healthily now as I'm now like a senior in, in university with uh, voice performance, but I, I can't always, I don't really know how to self check if I'm, you know, really keeping it um, healthy because I'll still get somewhat fatigued at the end and I, I don't quite know what to look for. So if you have any tips, I'd, I'd love to hear them. Yeah, I think a lot of the things that we've sort of touched on in various parts of this conversation will be helpful. You know, really thinking about um, efficiency of sound, um, depending on where you are in your range, like Nicole talked about, you know, really feeling a lot of backspace when she's up high and needing to find that sort of hooty sound. Um, for me, I think, I think more about just that idea, again, of like threading the needle and really... Um, thinking about what vowel choices I'm making so I can have very efficient, um, a very efficient resonant sound with less air pressure. Um, and always think, one other point I wanted to bring up was just the idea that voices always thrive on um, variety. And so that's part of why straight tone singing is fatiguing because, you know, when you do something static um, for a long time, it, 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 uh, 
sort of just um, tenses up your musculature. So really warming up properly all the time, cooling down. Do you ever use a straw? Are you familiar with that? I do. Um, I definitely do. I think sometimes I'm still trying to learn how to make sure that everything is free. So if you have any exercise, yeah. you get off. Well, there's tons. We're running out of time, but there's tons of great um, videos out there. And you can always like find my website and ask, reach out to me personally. I'm happy to share some tips. But when you're using the straw, you know, focusing in on that like buzzy feeling right where it's um, right at your embouchure. Um, and uh, I, it's a great warm up. It's a great cool down tool. So if you're finding yourself fatigued at the end of a practice session, um, do some gentle sirens through your straw. Um, and if there are problem areas in whatever repertoire you're working on, where you're worried if you're overblowing or whatnot, I often do those spots with a straw to try to find the right balance of air. Um, I think a lot about air pressure and, and focus of vowel. So. Thank you so much. That's Welcome. Yeah, which is, I'm Sarah, I'm so glad you brought that up because it's a really important point, especially for conductors as we're programming and we're planning our rehearsals that we're, we're being very careful of. Voices do the best when um, they have a wide gamut, um, a wide spectrum of, of styles. Um, so we have to be very careful of that. I'm always trying to be better at that. Um, and so just, yeah, it's important. And that reminded me of one other tip for conductors. If you do program something straight tone, but you have other more fuller repertoire on your concert program, start with the fuller stuff first in rehearsal to let the voices have a chance to like move and sing at a comfortable volume and with some spin and then do the straight tone stuff or more minimal vibrato repertoire later on in the rehearsal. Yeah, the, uh, the other way around is very difficult. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Great, we may have time for maybe one or two quick ones. If somebody wanted to, had to say something they want to ask, go oh. ahead, yes. Yes, hi, um, so I, I actually have been through three different schools of thought when it comes to singing in choirs and all these kinds of things. Right now I'm studying uh, choral conducting, but I have, I have trained in singing in straight tone, so I, 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 it doesn't feel uncomfortable for me, um, but a lot of the things that you all have been saying is kind of what I do. I kind of, I, it's not as, it will never be as full as, well, for a male, a chest voice. It will never be as rich and as vibrant as that. But I, I don't feel as though I'm holding anything in place, but I feel as though I'm just letting a lot more air through. And I do feel as though that I'm kind of just, I'm imagining myself walking and singing on a tightrope. And that's kind of how I, that's kind of how I navigate that, uh, that space. But now, uh, today, if I can, I, I'm, I'm supposed to be conducting some Mozart soon and I don't see myself conducting Mozart with uh, having the choir sing the entire mass straight tone, which is something, something that some people may do and some people may not. But I think doing that kind of strips away some of the color that we have naturally. And I uh, we need to be very cognizant of the fact that we want to sing our voices. As, as, and just reiterating a lot of the things that you all said, which I, which I genuinely appreciated. Um, I, what, what one of my teachers used to do to work around it per se is that uh, she, would, uh, she would mix the choir. And mixing the choir would have people not only hear more of the things that are happening inside, but I won't feel the pressure to sing like the person next to me, or I won't feel the pressure to sound or to blend in a particular way. But um, I, I just want to thank you all for this wonderful presentation. This is the first time I've been here and I think I will be here again. So thank you. Yeah, I'm so glad you made that point. Um, Spire does a lot of mix singing. I would say that that's mostly our default. Um, sometimes I say, hey, let's mix. And they're like, ah, oh, but most of the time, I would say 90% of the time, uh, it, it works. Um, we, um, unless I just want to check the chat real quick, I think we've got through um, all the questions, but I, I, I just want to say a wholehearted thanks to uh, both Sarah Anderson, Sarah Braley, and Nicole for joining in this conversation. It's an important one um, that we've talked about lots of things, and I hope this will be the first of uh, many. So thank you all for joining us. Um, this video will also be on Spire's YouTube page um, shortly. Um, so really appreciate you being here and we'll see you for the next lecture. Thanks. Ben. Thanks for